back into some work I've done earlier that might be of interest, um, but we'll see how timing works out. Um, oh, and in case you didn't see the note from Diane, we'll send out some um, notes and follow up at the end. Um, okay, so any, like, any questions before we get rolling? Anything anyone wants to share? Objections to the proposed outline? Okay, cool, let's get rolling. Um, okay, and, and I guess, Diane, we didn't pin this down. How, how long sh should I be plan on chatting for? As long as you continue to be interesting. Oh dear, <laughs> um, that, it might not be a very long meeting in this case. No, um, just just yeah, just go through. Okay, through yeah, I'll just I'll just roll through, and then maybe after I get after I finish the current work stuff, we can do a quick poll to see how people are feeling. Um, the other thing to mention is the we're planning on um, recording this call, this webinar. Um, so if anyone has any um, either objections or would prefer to be muted or have video off or whatever, I'm actually not exactly sure how Zoom does recording. But just so you know, um, feel free to ping me or Diane if. Uh, you have any questions about that or, or concerns. Um, okay, so let's get rolling. So the first project I want to share is called Scratch Encore. Um, this is a project being led by Diana Franklin, who's a um, computer science faculty at the University of Chicago, um, along with me and one of my grad students, Marika Conrad, here at Maryland, and the Chicago Public School District. Um, as some of you may know, Chicago public schools are really at the forefront of what computer science education in K-12 looks like in urban, in urban um, school districts. Um, so we're lucky enough to part with, partner with them. Um, and the big idea of this project is to try and explore this central question of how can we advance fourth through sixth grade computer science, how can we create advanced computer science instructional materials for fourth through sixth graders that give equal value to improving equity and student learning outcomes. Um, so in particular, what in meeting with um, CPS leadership, a challenge they were facing is they had all sorts of first exposure activities. These are things that students might do in fourth or fifth grade that are just kind of like an introduction to scratch and computing broadly. Um, and so they had a whole bunch of kind of first exposure activities. And then they had like exploring computer science in eighth and ninth grade, but not much in between. So they were finding teachers who were really enthusiastic about computer science would teach um, an intro, a first year scratch program in say fifth grade. And then for sixth grade, they weren't sure what, sure what to do. So they'd like pull out Python or something like that. And so one of the gaps that we identified was this kind of advanced introductory space where it turns out you can do really meaningful, sophisticated, kind of heavy lifting computer science work in Scratch. And so we're trying to design a curriculum that would kind of go deeper into more kind of meaty computer science content, but still be in, a, in Scratch in a playful, accessible context. Um, while also thinking about how can we do that in ways that prioritize equity and accessibility in a you know, large urban school district. So that was the central mission for this project. Um, and so what we settled on, so there's a couple different initiatives that, or, or efforts that kind of went in parallel, but one of the central ideas was to create um, a, modular, a modular curriculum where we pr present a sequence of concepts. So in this case, we start on the left with scratch basics, and then we introduce events, and then animations, and then conditional loops, and so on. And so this is grounded in the literature. This is what we think um, an introductory computer science curriculum learning progression looks like. Uh, and then we made multiple strands. And the idea behind the strands is each introduction of a concept is situated in a particular context. Um, and the contexts that we focused on were either a multicultural context, a youth culture context, and that's kind of thinking about things like music and games, or music and sports and things like that, or a video games based context. And so the idea is within, say, Scratch Basics, we have three modules that teach the same exact content but situate that content in three different er in three different contexts so that the teachers themselves could decide how they wanted to make their way through the curriculum, kind of aligning the way that materials are situated, the context in which they're situated to interests of their students. Um, and so this was this was our way of thinking about how can we um, how can we give agency to teachers, provide ways for teachers to, who might not have a lot of experience with computer science beforehand 
to better, better align the materials with their students, to start to think about what does it mean to kind of create this um, equitable, accessible computer science curriculum. So the current state of this um, project, this is an NSF, I should mention this, an NSF project, funded project. We're in our third year now. Um, thanks to COVID-19, we'll end up having a fourth year. Um, and so the current state of that project is we have um, 15 modular units. So this is like a 15 sets of activities going from um, at a really introductory concepts to more um, advanced concepts. And then we have these three, the three culturally relevant strands um, that, I just, uh, that I mentioned. Um, each of the activities has, um, follows a use, modify, create pedagogical structure. So the idea is we introduce a concept and first present a completed project that learners will see that concept in use. And then a set of activities where they take a functioning project and modify it to kind of get a sense of how a given concept behaves. And then the last piece of the um, module kind of opens up to let students design either their own projects from a blank slate or just this really basic starter project that they can then kind of build and expand however they want. Um, also worth mentioning is that these activities all have extensions. And so this is our way to kind of, for students who have already had a significant amount of scratch prior exposure, this is a way to keep them engaged. So we suggest ways that they can kind of build on or expand the uh, um, modules that within the activity. Um, we've also developed what we call the tip and see comprehension strategy. This is a scaffolded approach to help students make sense of scratch projects and kind of a, a focus their attention on different parts. So looking at what the title of the project is, what blocks are being used, um, what events are being used, the number of sprites, just kind of like hold their hand, kind of helping them learn how to read a scratch project so they can kind of better make sense of what a program is going to do. Um, all of these activities have supporting teacher materials. Um, this is I means comprehensive lesson plans, particular discussion prompts, explanations, answer keys. And we also have an automated project assessment tool um, that doesn't kind of do everything, but can help teachers get a general sense of where students are and what the contents of students' projects are without having to go through and manually open and read each one. Um, and then there's also a supp um, supporting student materials. And this is things like worksheets, student guides, pen and paper written assessments, which was feedback we got from teachers as being really productive and useful. Um, and potentially most important for all of this is that all of these materials are freely available online. Um, the easiest way to get there is if you just Google or use whatever search engine you want. Um, if you just search for Scratch Encore, we're usually the top hit or pretty close to the top. Um, and from there, you can see the lessons. And I think we ask you just to sign up so we can keep track of how many people have um, requested them. But then you can get pretty much the whole thing. It's like if you download it all at once as a PDF, it's a, I don't know, a couple hundred pages. So there's a lot there. Um, but yeah, we really encourage you. Uh, we would love to have people try this out in their classes or just in general, any ideas, feedback you have for us. Um, we'd love to hear it. We've um, started, the research on this project has started to come out. We have um, at the SIGSI that, at the SIGSI that wasn't, we were going to present um, our scratch on, our first kind of big scratch encore paper presenting roughly what I just shared with you guys, which was kind of like the idea behind what we were trying to do and kind of the shape that it took. Um, we're about to submit an ICER paper kind of looking at research of how, how learners, how the use, modify, create sequence supported learners and kind of attending to desired content while also kind of exploring and getting some of those personally meaningful style projects um, as part of what, what kids were doing in the classroom. Um, okay, so that's the first big project. Well, there's a second part to it, but I, I'm gonna pause there if there are any questions, comments, observations about the Scratch Encore project. I'll give people a minute. So here's, here's me planning summer PD. Let's see, you've got a grad student who can put some things together. Are you planning any kind of PD for it coming up? So good question. For now, the, because this is a collaboration with the Chicago Public School District, we're planning on running a PD, but it's going to be based in Chicago, um, which is where this research is mainly happening. For those of you who don't know, I, was, um, I did a postdoc at University of Chicago before I came out to Maryland. And so this kind of project grew up there, which is why it's Chicago-based versus 
more Maryland centric. Um, but we are doing, um, we are running a PD and to your follow up question, we haven't yet figured out exactly what that PD is going to look like if it's going to be online or offline or just kind of what in some ways because we're working closely with the district we're kind of waiting to take cues from them um about how their what their plan moving forward is going to be um but i will as that um as we figure that out diane and others will very happily keep people in um informed on kind of how we're trying to solve this problem um so a question can i provide the url because you're finding several sites are there rival scratch encore sites um, the uh, here let me i'll put it in the chat it's um it's hosted at, on the canon lab website canon lab is diana franklin's um research group um and so i will put it in the chat for everyone to make sure that you're not you're not landing on some knockoff scratch encore um website how do i get back to chat there it is um Give me one sec to try and do seven things at once. I got it, David. Oh, yep. Diane sent I'll it. I'll do chat for you. Just tell me, tell me what you want. Yep, that's the one. So um, yes. Yeah. Other questions in there, if you want. Do you want to read? Uh, it's easier if I read them to you, or do you want to? Um, I, I can keep tabs on it if, if that's okay. okay. If you don't mind. Um, okay. So the feedback for this work so far, um, the teachers that we're working with have been extremely enthusiastic about this. Um, the materials that we've developed. Um, by nature of it being a partnership with CPS, we have current and former teachers actively working on the development of the curricular materials. And so that's something, and so as a result, it's like classroom teachers giving input. And so, for example, our materials initially all used to be using Google Docs and online, which is a kind of a natural thing for a computer science oriented person to do. But the feedback we got from teachers was that they wanted more pen and paper things just because of the classroom norms that had been set up in fifth and sixth grade, that's what students were used to and that's what teachers were used to. And so that's an example of like fee a feedback from teachers that changed our trajectory and changed our approach and made it um, more inviting and accessible and kind of trying to meet teachers' needs where they were. And so there've been a bunch of examples of that type of thing. Um, so for the most part, um, the feedback has been really encouraging. And I think a lot of that has to do with having early teacher input and also kind of the level of completeness of the materials where it's kind of all there instead of just skeletons of activities or kind of loosely structured things that you can the teachers can kind of like need to cobble together on their own this is kind of intended to be everything that teachers need to be an again advanced introductory computer science um scratch-based computer science class um and in terms of we don't have any we actually we have a boatload of we've been doing interviews observations we have a boatload of data we haven't yet synthesized that in any meaningful easily digestible way um, but that's definitely on our to-do list moving forward. Um, do you have data? So yes, we have used these with um, students. Ooh, I don't know the numbers offhand. Um, we've trained it probably in the order of like 40 to 50 teachers. So we have like a couple hundred students who have gone through these. Um, we're now in our, we, this is our finishing up our second year of teachers teaching these materials. Um, the paper that we were going to present at 60 shared some of those results and for the most part are really encouraging. Um, unfortunately, due to the fact that CPS is closed down the way that most school districts, maybe all school districts are closed down, we weren't able to do the last piece of our big study that was going to happen in the third year of the research project, which is really unfortunate. Um, but the data we have so far is really encouraging in terms of teachers really liking it, students being engaged, a pretty, a pretty high level of engagement and relatively sophisticated projects being developed by students. Um, what we don't have is the like, the sound bite comparative, like students scored this high or this much better than that. We don't have that because that was that last piece that was gonna come in this school year. Um, but the short answer is yes, and there's a, a bunch more coming. Um, oh, there's an NSF Scratch on course site. Great. Hopefully that's our project <laughs> and showing the same thing. Um, how many teachers have used it and in what context did they use it more? Um, again, in terms of, uh, you know, I should have made sure that my um, graduate student, Martha Conrad, was here because she knows all, she's much more in the weeds on all this, so we know the answer to these questions off the top of her head. Um, I think it's in the order of like 40 to 50 teachers are doing it that we know of in CPS. The, the materials have been downloaded a couple hundred times from all over the world 
based on kind of conversations like this. Um, in terms of what context did they use it more, I don't know exactly what you mean by context, so feel free to provide more detail. Um, but for the most part, it's being used in middle school classrooms. And again, because of CPS being CPS, they've had um, district-wide and within school administrative support. Um, the, yeah, so it's happening in their classrooms and kind of aligned with whatever structure the schools are using. The, the curriculum itself is intended to be module, uh, is intended to be modular. So it can be taught on consecutive days, it can be taught once a week, it can be taught um, really, there was, we were intentional in trying to make it modular, recognizing that the way that computer science is taught is uniform across schools, across districts, across countries. Um, so we, we tried to um, design to protect against that. You can let us know how successful we were, but for the, so thus far, it's, it's, we've been, I think, pretty, pretty lucky. Um, what are the, were the teachers gen ed teachers or ITCS teachers? It was a mix of both. Um, which I think is very reflective of who's teaching middle school computer science these days. There's some teachers who um, are members of the Chicago CSTA chapter and like super comfortable and knowledgeable about this, about everything. And then there are other teachers who are brand new to computer science um, who, yeah, would have been gen ed teachers or like have math specializations or something like that who are just being introduced. Um, and again, kind of the completeness of the materials, I think, has gone a long way in helping more novice teachers. Um, and by completing some materials, I mean like discussion prompts, um, kind of fully formed lesson plans, student materials. There, there isn't that much additional work in terms of like the materials themselves that needs to go into it, um, which I think is really helpful in, in terms of providing a high level of scaffolding. Um, you indicated the materials are developed for different contexts. Um, context being a slightly overloaded term, different contexts, you might mean different schools and school situations, which um, I think is addressed by my earlier comment about how it was modular to try and fit into whatever context teachers are using. Um, the materials themselves, we're trying to situate the content across different contexts. Um, and that gets back to this, the idea of having a multicultural context, a gaming, a multicultural strand, a gaming strand, and a youth cultural strand. The idea there is that teachers kind of have some flexibility in terms of how they present material content to students in a way to kind of help students be a little more engaged. Um, if I'm, as an aside, if I'm not answering your question, feel free to like just chat again and say, can you re-answer this question? Because I was actually talking about, it. I was ask, ask, asking about one, something else. Um, and you're also welcome to just like unmute yourself and, and interject and then you can jump to the head of the, the question queue instead of politely waiting as I turn through the chat comments. Um, uh, so, okay, good question about um, what types of classes these are in and whether they're like computer science classes or computational thinking situated within other contexts. So I think up to this point, I haven't really used the term computational thinking because this is explicitly a computer science curriculum. Um, so I mean, obviously all sorts of computational thinking is happening, but it is distinctly not an integrated approach where we're trying to bring computer science into a math or social studies class. This is very much um, intended to be a computer science class for middle school students. I have other work that I'll get to next that's taking this other more integrated approach of thinking about bringing computing and computational thinking into existing classes, but that is not what Scratch Encore is. Scratch Encore is um, kind of full on computer science. I mean, it'd be great if, if a social studies or English language arts teacher chose to teach it, we would love that. Um, but that's not the intended audience. Um, okay, I think that's all the questions. These are great questions. Um, and if, uh, if you guys have other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, uh, okay, another course came, came in. Do these courses move beyond blocked coding? No, they do not. It's, so everything is within Scratch. Um, so the intention here was to go deeper into computer science content, staying within Scratch explicitly. Um, the, the reason we're using Scratch is strategic because essentially that's what teachers and schools wanted to use. Um, in prior work, we kind of created our own block-based environments and blah, 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 um, but found that teachers would often just say like, is this like Scratch? Can I use Scratch, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so we're intentionally keeping it within Scratch. It's also worth mentioning, this is kind of a quote unquote, officially sanctioned Scratch curriculum 
um, and that we got permission from Mitch and his team to call it Scratch Encore, and they were kind of supportive of what we're doing. Um, the, I mean, I have a, a, some other work looking at what is a, how does one go from block-based to text-based coding and scaffolds for that, and et cetera, et cetera. And that's kind of at the that's some, some prior work, so at the tail end of my um, rambly slides. Um, but I'm happy to talk much more about that if you're interested in in it. And and also that's kind of a direction of future work that we've been thinking about. Um, another question. You have to point to a few features that make your materials different from other Scratch-related activities that are available through other organizations. So what are some of those features? Great question. Um, so one of them is we're try, again, this idea of advanced introductory materials. So it's 15 lessons where we're progressively going deeper into computer science content. Um, so essentially, like our Scratch Basics activity, the very first at, the very first module probably covers a lot of like the basic content that you would see in other um, that in other Scratch curricula, and so we're trying to go way past that into like synchronization and um, decomposition by decomposition and kind of um, different forms of control structures. Trying to yeah go a little deeper into computer science content. So that's one piece. The second piece is this modular design. The same content is can be taught using situated in different contexts, meaning like writing projects about public transit or writing projects about um, Martin Luther King Day or writing projects about, or like writing a game that has like kind of like a bee buzzing around. All three of those will teach the same con computer science content. So that flexibility to customize co and navigate context within a curriculum I think is pretty unique. Um, and then the last bit would just be like the, the level of support available with the resources themselves, having like discussion prompts and assessments and worksheets. Um, a lot of computer science, introductory computer science curricula kind of just have a sequence of like scratch activities and are, are or a sequence of programming activities and are pretty coupled to programming activities where we're also thinking about right discussion prompts and worksheets and other things like that. Um, and again, like in some ways, I'm trying to sell everyone on how great this curriculum is, but at the same time, this is an ongoing active research project. So if you see gaps in it or things that we haven't addressed or kind of issues as you're scrolling through it, please absolutely let us know. This is very much um, a work in progress. I mean, this is kind of like our first pass. Well, we've gone through an iterative design process, but this is kind of the version 1.0 of our like refined finalized materials, but hopefully we expect there to be future versions. Okay, so that was a whole bunch about Scratch Encore. I love all the questions, really excited about people think the idea of um, people beyond CPS diving in and using them. Also worth saying, like you're very welcome. All of the Scratch Encore materials have associated Scratch projects um, that are publicly available in the Scratch community, um, but you are very welcome to take the materials and use them however you see fit. This isn't a, um, an all or nothing thing, so it's like, you know, there's one particular, you're working with some teachers who are really struggling about what's the best way to introduce younger learners to conditional logic, like just check out the conditional logic module and see how we're doing it there, like, and maybe you'll get some ideas. Really, just please use these materials in whatever way you think would be most useful and effective. That's really um, what we're hoping. Um, okay, cool. So that's, um, that's the Scratch Encore curricular materials. How does multicultural, uh, another question, um, better late than ever. How does multicultural work differ from non-multicultural work exposures? Um, so the idea behind the multicultural strand is that the context that we're situating, uh, situating computing content in kind of aligns with what's in the literature called historical, um, historical cultures. And so this would be things like we have a Black History Month activity, we have a um, offerenda activity, we have a Native American situated activity. So these are just kind of different um, cultures that students may or may not, uh, with different cultures that might align to students' backgrounds and things that students would be familiar with, these heritage cultures from outside of their classroom. And so we're trying to kind of draw and make connections to those resources. The other, the other idea there is that, for example, thinking about um, our Black History Month activities is that, or, or our um, like Martin Luther King Day activities, is that it's possible then for teachers based on kind of larger themes and celebrations happening across the school to draw from um, 
the to align the way that computing is being taught within that month with kind of things that are happening within the larger school. Um, another example, we have a Deus del Muerte activity. So if there's kind of like a celebration of um, Latin culture happening across the school, we have a way to align our computing activities with those. Like that's kind of how we're thinking about it. Um, if you have more, if you have thoughts on that or other ideas or like critiques, would love to hear them. Um, and this in particular is something that my grad student, Marika Conrad, is thinking a lot about. Um, and so if you have ideas for other contexts or things like that, we would love to hear them. Okay, last chance for questions. I love all these questions, but we're definitely not gonna get through all my slides, but that's totally fine. Um, oh, another one came in. Did you say the modules are not, did you say that the modules are not subject matter specific and can be used for any subject area? Um, so there's subject, I'm gonna go back. So this is an example of the first couple of strands. So the content that we're teaching is a computer science learning trajectory based on prior research by Diana and others around kind of how to introduce kids to computer science. And so the content in that respect is um, pretty well defined. Where the variability and flexibility comes in is in what context that content is situated. Are you going to learn about conditional loops by writing games or by like controlling um, trains on the Chicago public transit system. And so in those two contexts, you're engaging with the same conditional looping idea, but in one case, the sprites look like trains, and in the other case, the sprites look like you know mice moving around a, a maze. And so that's what I mean by shared content, but different contexts. Um, and then in terms of like situating it in whatever subject area, like again, this is a computer science curriculum, so it's intended to live in whatever form of computer science instruction lives within the school. It is explicitly not an integrated approach. And I'll talk a little bit about what an integrated approach looks like um, in the next project. And again, it's good that we're getting all these questions for the Scratch Encore project, because of the things I'm gonna talk about, this one's the most mature um, and kind of the most ready for people to be adopting or looking to for advice and ideas. Um, okay, so that's um, Scratch Encore. The other, um, so that's a Scratch Encore curricular materials. The other big contribution that's come out of this research project is the what we call the teacher accessibility, equity, and content rubric. Um, so the tech rubric, that's our acronym. So the idea here, this is also freely available online. Um, if you look at the Scratch Encore website, um, at the top there's this um, research tab and under that there's a tech rubric. And actually I'll put that URL into, in the um, chat as well. So the idea behind the tech rubric is to create a, a resource to help educational decision makers evaluate potential computing curricula. And so what that means is you might be a teacher or a district leader or a, a computer science professor who studies databases or whatever and are being asked to make recommendations about um, what a particular technology or particular curriculum. Um, and so the idea is this is a rubric to help support that decision-making process. And so what we have is kind of three dimensions and, and on the slide content is the one that's in front. So I'll talk about that one first. So for example, um, we provide this rubric that essentially asks, um, that uh, tries to uh, help you attend to particular characteristics of materials. For example, in the content strand it might be looking at what computer science content is being covered like does it align with published standards because that's really important does it use appropriate disciplinary terminology um, what pedagogical practices if any are being incorporated um, what in, what uh, from an instructional instructional design perspective what content is being presented like are there questions that promote higher order thinking does it in consider students' prior knowledge with respect to the way that the computing content is being introduced. The idea is like we have this long checklist of things. Well, it's not that long. We have this checklist of things to help uh, to help people who might be new to, to new to the like evaluation of curriculum materials. A long checklist to help them evaluate the materials. And so the three dimensions we attend to content. So how do you evaluate whether or not the computing content is appropriate, high quality, robust, etc. Um, with respect to equity, does the 
computing content attend to issues of culture, of learner identity, of learner exceptionalities, and we define what those things mean within the rubric. And then in terms of teacher accessibility, this is recognizing not there are a lot of teachers new to the discipline of computer science and new to teaching computing. So do the materials support teachers? Um, do the materials contain um, supplemental materials around like student prompts and necessary worksheets? Are there assessments that come along with these things? Um, and the idea here is, again, to support education decision makers in making informed decisions, but then also not just, on the one hand, it might be to evaluate whether or not to adopt a set of materials. Uh, another role it could play is material, you have to teach a certain set of materials, and so this can help you identify strengths and weaknesses. Like, oh, you know, this, these materials are really strong with respect to aligning with standards, but they don't provide much in the way of um, pedagogical supports for teachers navigating a full class of students. So then you and your expertise could, in working with teachers, you can kind of help fill in those gaps or address those perceived weaknesses. Um, a third role that it could play, which may or may not be of use to people here, is if you're designing your own materials yourself. Um, and this is actually in our creation of Scratch Encore, we use the, the tech rubric to evaluate our own materials. And in evaluating our own materials, recognize missed opportunities to say, support um, either it, it support students who have more prior experience with Scratch or like or gaps in terms of how we supported teachers in um, having classroom discussions or gaps in uh, worksheets in terms of what they how they were aligned to the content things like that um, so yeah so that's the tech rubric um, there's a long boring paper where we go into all the weeds of how it was generated and examples of it being applied um, if you look at that website that I put in the chat, there's a PDF version of the rubric. There's also a Google Sheets version. If you, you could maybe tell this is based on a spreadsheet. And so we have a Google Sheets version that you can just copy and then use to evaluate whatever materials that you might be interested in using. Um, yeah, again, the first the rubric has been published, but all of these things are continual, are always being revised and improved and um, updated. So we would love to get your feedback on the rubric, you know, hearing firsthand experiences of you trying to apply it and what made sense, what didn't, or like how you applied it and ended up making this change or that change. Um, so one, one example that might resonate with some people here, I taught, I teach a class to in-service K-8 teachers who are um, getting a master's degree in teacher leadership. Um, and I teach the like technology component to that. And so these are K through eight teachers um, across the board, some like seventh and eighth grade math teachers, but then also like, you know, kindergarten and first grade generalists. We did an in-class assignment having them use the tech rubric to evaluate a set of teaching materials. Um, and the feedback from that from the teachers was that it was really productive because it was not the type of thing that they had done in the past because teachers are often just kind of given materials to teach. And as they moved into leadership roles, the expectation was they'd be asked to do more of these kind of higher level evaluative, make decisions at the curricular level type um, activity. Like that's part of what they hope their future job responsibilities look like. Um, and the feedback was really productive in terms of this being a useful resource to kind of help them know what to look for and kind of structure the activity of evaluating a curriculum, which is a pretty kind of big amorphous problem to be given. And so and we actually, have a paper currently under review looking at how the tech rubric in particular help teachers attend to um, certain aspects of the curriculum, particularly around questions of equity. Like they, the teachers felt pretty good about evaluating um, like teacher accessibility, like what resources are there to help teachers. But um, without the help of the rubric, we're often not thinking about um, issues, uh, dimensions of equity uh, with respect to the material. So in that respect, we thought this was a really productive resource. Okay, I'm gonna pause there for a minute. Um, again, really available, would love to get your feedback. Okay, a few less questions than we had for Scratch Encore, totally fine. Everybody's reading the fine print. <laughs> That's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, I'm gonna keep rolling then, but again, feel free to interject later or send me an email. I mean, I love talking about this stuff all day, every day. Okay, um, so that is 
Um, so that's kind of generally the Scratch Encore project. And, and to an earlier comment that was made, that was very much a computer science education project. We're trying to teach computer science education and we're calling it computer science education. Um, shifting gears, I have a second project that is currently a collaboration with, the D, with um, DC public schools that is looking at um, kind of the other trendy approach in computing education right now which is looking at ways to integrate computational thinking into existing subjects. Um, and if people have questions about that, I can talk a whole bunch more about what, that, what, I, what I mean when I say computational thinking and what I mean when I say computational thinking integrated into other subjects. Um, so this, the Sphero.Math project is a collaboration between University of Maryland, DC Public Schools. Um, it's funded first by a Spencer project that was called Early Computational Thinking for All, exploring the mutually supportive nature of mathematics and computational in fourth grade classrooms. And even in that title, you can kind of see the thing that we were trying to get at, the key, term, the key phrase being mutually supportive nature. <clears throat> so the, the big idea is we have this theory that if the materials are well designed, that an, um, it's possible to create ex learning experiences where Computational thinking in computing is used as a way to help students um, develop deeper content understanding, in this case, math. But at the same time, math can serve as a productive context for learners to explore and engage in meaningful computational thinking. And so the hypothesis is that you can have this mutually supportive design where the domain area, in this case, math, supports computational thinking, and computational thinking supports mathematics learning. And essentially, we're trying to design materials and kind of um, that, that essentially serve as an exist existence proof. This is what it looks like for instructional materials to be mutually supportive. Um, and this is really important because um, we've gotten pushback from, and this might be true for some of you, walking into a science teacher's classroom, classroom and saying, hi, science teacher, we now also want you to teach computational thinking. And they say, okay, cool, that's great, but I'm evaluated by my ability to teach science content. Or I've spent the last 25 years teaching science, and so I'm gonna keep teaching science. Some of this has been made a little easier as standards change. Like for example, in the context of science, the computational thinking as it now shows up in next generation science standards, it becomes a little easier to convince that science teacher. Um, but you can imagine walking into a social studies classroom saying, hey, we want you to start teaching computational thinking alongside your social studies material and getting pushback saying, no, 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 like that's just gonna take away from what we're doing. The idea behind this project is to build an empirical basis showing that um, it's, possible to, for these two things to be mutually supportive of each other. So that's the big vision. Um, that, so it started as a Spencer project. We've since gotten supplemental funding from the Department of Education to build on this work, particularly attending to neurodiverse learners. And so this is the, what we call the INFACT project, including neurodiversity and foundational and applied computational thinking. Um, and in particular, the work there is thinking about how situating computational thinking in physical context like robotics and physical devices provides new pathways for learners to explore computational thinking concepts. And this is particularly, can be particularly generative for learners who might have um, difficulty with reading comprehension or um, might have difficulty like verbalizing their ideas but can express them gesturally in other ways. And so we're kind of exploring what that looks like. Um, okay, so I just kind of said all this, but to put it succinctly, um, the focus of this work is on investigating the mutually supportive nature of computational thinking and mathematics and exploring how such integrated curricula can be enacted within an urban classroom. And so we're working right now with DCPS and we are working in kind of quote unquote normal regular DCPS classrooms. And so that we're not working in, these aren't, um, these aren't kind of, um, what do they call them? Enrichment activities that happen at the end of the day. We're not working with the uh, magnet schools that have the best and brightest. We're just working with neighborhood DCPS schools um, in their existing fourth grade math classrooms with existing fourth grade math teachers. Um, so that's the context that we're working in. Um, so to give you an example of what these activities, uh, what one of these activities look like. Um, so this is an activity that we did with a teacher at the end of the last school year. Um, so on the left, some of you might recognize this type of floor mat. It's, this is the carpet that the teacher has in her classroom and she uses it for all sorts of things. But importantly, it has a grid overlaid on top of it. And so what the teacher, what we did is made this um, 
obstacle course for students to follow. And so it starts on that X at the bottom with, in masking tape in the green square, and then you kind of go forward three and a half squares, and then you go to the left, two full squares, and you come back down, et cetera. And so, you, right, the, the overarching goal is for students to write a program to get their Sphero to navigate this maze. Um, the big twist is that instead of letting students write their program by putting the Sphero on the carpet and having it, and, and kind of like iteratively programming that way, every student was given this, uh, essentially a map or a key of the course. And so they were told the dimensions of each carpet square. So in this case, a carpet square is 24 inches tall and 21 inches wide, and then asked to write a program, to ask to essentially write a program to navigate the full maze based on using this um, kind of this map or this legend. And so what students ended up having to do is, so example, that first segment is three and a half squares long. And so students need to figure, needed to figure out how to get their Sphero to move three and a half squares, knowing that a square was 24 inches tall. And so what we saw students doing, some students would just do the math of 24 plus 24 plus 24 plus half of 24, and then try and make one command that would run that long. But we also saw students essentially creating a pro, writing a program or a function that got their Sphero to roll 24 inches essentially modularizing their solution, saying we want a command that rolls one carpet square. And then because we have to go three and a half carpet squares, we'll run that one command three times and then figure out a way to cut that command in half. And so essentially they're um, decomposing the problem into this modular solution, in, in this case modular solution being a carpet square, and then iteratively building up their program from there. Um, and we, I think it's on the next slide. Oh, I didn't, it's at the end of the next slide. Um, so we've done some, we recorded students kind of going through this process and we saw some really rich mathematical and computational thinking around trying to write a program to run exactly one square. It turns out in fourth grade math, there's a bunch of focus around questions of measurement and precision. And so it turns out if, you, if you're gonna take this modular approach and you try you write a program to try and roll 24 inches, but it actually rolls 25 inches, that if you, use a, if you then just use your 25 inch program over the course of the maze, you'll get increasingly further and further off of the course because you'll start off by being off by one inch, but then it becomes two inches and then three inches as you go because you're, and so there's this question of um, kind of this compounding nature of error which is a relatively sophisticated thing to be for a fourth grader to be thinking about, but it aligns well with the, um, the math standard that I'm blanking on, the Common Core math standards for fourth grade around measurement and precision. Um, and then in kind of building a program that rolls exactly 24 inches, we see students engaging in a lot of rich computational thinking around iterative design and um, refinement, debugging, um, Decompo uh, decomposition of problems in terms of modularizing the solution for the map, like all, all sorts of rich things happening there. Um, so that's, that's an example of what a Sphero math activity looks like. So in terms of where that project currently is, we have 15 classroom ready lessons. Um, each lesson includes a lesson plan and then slides that go along with it. Um, and then for a bunch of the lessons, we have a supporting Sphero.edu activity. So Sphero.edu is similar to the Scratch community where it's like an online open uh, repository of uh, um, Sphere activities, but they have a little more structure in that you can also have a sequence of activities that goes along with those programs. Um, and then each of those activities are aligned to math and computational thinking standards. And then in the case of DCPS, all we kind of like have the technical pieces taken care of. All that being said, it's worth mentioning that this project is not, is not nearly, uh, the materials are not as robust as the Scratch Encore, material, Encore materials. Sphero.math is kind of in an one and a half years in, and there's kind of like a lot more uncertainty and revision happening, whereas um, the Scratch Encore materials were kind of at the, t the end of a third year where a lot more, a, a lot, we had a lot more time to work on it, and also a lot more direct involvement of teachers at various levels. Um, so just kind of like setting expectations for the two sets of curricular materials. Um, the other thing worth mentioning is that these materials are relatively tightly coupled to the Sphero robot and the Sphero platform. Um, that was in part because of those were the resources that the DCPS system has at their disposal. And so they were looking for ways to use those materials. 
Um, the work that we're doing with the Department of Education, we're starting to think about how to modify those materials. So they could work more with more general with more generally any set of robotics. And so it's kind of like any ro any robotic toolkit that just like supports movement and turning and like blinking or some other form of communication. Um, but currently, it's all pretty tightly coupled to the um, the Sphero. Um, this is probably less interesting, but last school year we um, trained 20 teachers from 10 schools and collected data in one classroom. This current school year, we trained an additional 13 teachers from eight schools <coughs> and were past tense collecting data in classrooms, but um, as you could probably guess, that has all stopped. So this right now we're not collecting any more data, which is a real tragedy. Um, Irene is asking if the PD was online or face-to-face. -face. Because this is a collaboration with DCPS, we were able to run the professional development as part of DCPS's official professional development um, days. And so they were face-to-face -face in schools with the help of um, district leadership. Um, another, oh, common sounds like a very good project. We developed many of these integrated activities using computing science and mathematics and several fun projects more meaningful to teach CS and help students apply math and science when using computing. Couldn't agree more. Um, this is from Manaz. Um, if, Manaz, if you wanna chime in and give a pitch for your project or where your resources live, well, please feel free to take the mic. You also don't have to, if you wanna just remain anonymous, you're welcome to. Okay, I'll take that as politely saying thank you, but no thank you. Um, are, so are the, do we have sample lessons? Uh, oh, oh, great. So Mazan, um, Manaz will share these with me later. That'd be great, I would love to see them. Um, so in terms of sample lesson plans to showcase, we have, um, I can send them out. I don't think they're publicly available the way that the, Sphere, the Scratch Encore ones are which again reflects kind of the level of maturity. But that being said, if you shoot me an email, I will happily send you the materials that we have. Um, we do have, they do live in a couple different forms, but I can send a big PDF with all of them. Um, or if you're interested in just one or two, I can send some along. Um, yeah, yeah, if you shoot me an email, that's probably the best way to get them because we're not quite ready to share them publicly because we're still, they're still actively under development. Um, but again, would love to get feedback. And if this is something that could be useful to you, or, or very, I'm very happy to share. Um, okay, I think, so that's it for Sphero.math. Oh, great question. Do you plan to use the tech rubric with these plans? Um, we hadn't, but we absolutely will. That is a great suggestion. It's like, if for those of you who are, familiar this is essentially like the dog fooding process where you essentially like have to use your own materials to get to know them like eating your own eating your own dog food so yeah that's a great com a great comment and we did that with scratch encore haven't yet done that with sphero math but i love that suggestion um it's a little different because it's not specifically about computer science in the same way but nevertheless like that would absolutely help us it would definitely bring to light gaps in our current materials so i, lo I love that suggestion thank you um, how are we doing on time? Oh, almost three. Okay, let me, I'm going to very quickly just run through the last few things so you, that are currently under, uh, we're currently underway so you at least know that they exist and then we could maybe set up another one of these webinars or do we have an offline conversation if that'd be useful. Um, potentially of less interest to folks, um, I have a project looking at computational thinking in libraries. It's called Impact Libraries, Improving Assessment of Computational Thinking in Libraries. Um, the very short description of that project is to focus on computational thinking, programming, and assessment in libraries and other formal environments. In particular, we're trying to identify the computational thinking literacy that can be developed with youth um, in libraries and other informal contexts, creating assessment tools that can be used to help library staff evaluate their computational thinking materials and programs um, and then finally use these assessments to help improve existing uh, programs offered in public libraries. Um, the short version of this project is that um, all sorts of cool innovative fun engaging computational thinking work is happening in libraries but it's really challenging to evaluate them and so what library staff often end up having to rely on is um, 
attendance numbers and retention numbers, how many students came, how many kids came to an activity and how many students came back for an activity, which is a really useful thing to know as a proxy of engagement, but says absolutely nothing about learning or shifts in identity or enthusiasm or really like kind of, it's just a, a base level of, of um, a base level way to evaluate CT programming. And so our project is working with library staff to develop a suite of resources to kind of help them better evaluate the work, the material that they're doing, and then to use those evaluate, use those assessments to improve existing computational thinking um, programming. Um, uh, question, can you define what you mean by computational thinking literacy? Um, good question. So my, t and so the way that I think about computational literacy or computational thinking broadly is the set of skills associated with helping people solve problems using computational tools and technologies. And so a lot of that ends up having to draw, a lot of that draws directly from kind of foundational compu computer science ideas. Um, for this project, we're relying on the kind of Prada plus programming way of operationalizing computational thinking. And so for those of you not familiar with the Prada acronym, which I don't love, but it's at least easy to remember, Prada breaks down to pattern recognition, abstraction, decomposition, and algorithms. And so these are kind of four high level, very productive, computational thinking skills that are broadly applicable. And then the last piece I said, product plus programming, is taking those four kind of big ideas um, and then concretely employing them in some kind of programming context where programming generally means kind of ex expressing a set of instructions that a computer or technological device can carry out. Um, sorry if that was a little in the weeds. Unfortunately, that's kind of the space that we live in with computational thinking. Um, yeah, here we use computational thinking literacy, which is particularly resonates with libraries and the mission of libraries. And so this is just improving students' fluency with being able to not just recognize when they're being used by others, but being able to use them themselves. This draws on um, Andy DeSess's construct of computational literacy, if you're familiar with that. And that's kind of a, a, a an early version of this idea that I think is really important and really powerful. And so literacy is also attending to kind of that theoretical intellectual lineage. Um, Irene, I don't know if that totally answered your question, but it, I don't know, it was a rambly academic answer. And I, I'm happy to go into more detail, um, maybe offline if, you're, if you'd like to, if that'd be useful. Um, and then the last piece um, is the project that work that I'm doing with Jamplane, funded by the Maryland Center for Computing Education. Um, and in particular, we're working on building resources to increase um, teacher computer science teacher capacity across the state. Um, and our form of that is working towards creating a computer science teacher methods course to prepare teachers to lead engaging and successful computer science classes in high schools across the state. Um, and kind of what we've done for that so far is reached out to collaborators across the country to have a set of exemplary computer science teacher and preparation materials. We also have the set of materials that were developed as part of the CS Matters work that Diane and others across the state were very active in building. Um, also at the University of Maryland College Park, we have a Terrapin Teachers Program. This is our flavor of the UTeach, which takes students from within the discipline. So this is like math and science students and prepares them to be math and science teachers. We've been working on building that capacity within the computer science department. So we've recruited two computer science master teachers and are actively recruiting and building a pipeline of computer science undergrads to feed into uh, a teaching career. Um, and then we're also exploring other ways as I'm, sh I'm guessing many of you know, there's challenge, it's not the easiest way to become a computer science teacher in the state of Maryland is to become a math teacher and then get a secondary accreditation, which is a rather roundabout way to go about it versus majoring in computer science and then getting the um, teaching endorsement certification on top of that. So we're exploring alternative ways to, alternative pathways towards developing um, and preparing computer science teachers. One of those is what we're calling the iSchool track, which is kind of recognizing that a lot of what K-12 computers, or what a lot of what high school computer science looks like is actually taught in the iSchool. And this is considering issues of social and cultural impacts of computing, 
design, data, human computer interaction, robotics, as well as kind of foundational computer science concepts that you'd see on the AP in the AP courses. All of those concepts live within the iSchool um, and, and present a much more kind of uh, human centric, social, socially oriented version of that, which aligns well with the demands of what it means to be a teacher. So we're looking at building out an iSchool, an iSchool pathway that could lead toward computer science teacher certification. And then the other piece is looking at a joint math plus CS track. And this is a, us trying to build on the success of um, existing pathways to train math teachers where they take classes within the math department, but also in the College of Education. So we're looking at ways to build, to add on some computer science content to that track so that teachers coming through that track would be better prepared to teach both math and computer science. Um, that was a very quick rundown of the various things that we're trying to do on that front. And then we also are, are planning on doing some outreach to teachers to help revise the, material, the teaching materials that we hope to use in future methods courses, but that's very much underway. Um, Deborah is asking, are you able to share what you have um, in your methods class compilation yet? Um, send me an email, we're happy to. It's not, we're not that far along with it because our current effort has been in other places, but um, Jan and I, again, like, Full transparency, trying very happy to share the materials that we have. Um, would you be able to share your project description for the math plus CS? We're developing an example case, an example case studying for colleges for colleges of teacher education. Um, very much so. That's been made a little more complicated because the lead math the lead person on the math side is currently on sabbatical, um, which is just the nature of trying to do any of these things. It's you know what's the expression? It's like changing the wheels on a car going 60 miles, when you're going 60 miles on a highway, like things don't really stop to build these things up. Um, but yeah, shoot me an email and I um, will we'll share what we have. And I'll also loop in Jan Plain, who's my collaborator on this project, who has a bit more institutional knowledge of how all this works, at least within the um, College Park campus. And so, yeah, shoot me an email, I'll happily share, share what we have. Um, that was my last slide and um, only went five minutes over and flew through the last two projects, but that's fine. What the two master teachers do, Deborah is asking, great question. So they have a dual role. They do some teaching and support within the computer science department. They do mentoring of, and recruitment of current computer science teachers to try and um, feed them into the Terrapin teacher pipeline. They're also working in current, um, Oh shoot, I don't know if it's, I think, I don't know if it's Montgomery County or Prince George's County. I wanna say Montgomery County, I should definitely know that. Montgomery. With, Montgomery. Yeah, yeah, Montgomery, thank you, Diane. They're working with um, current high schools in Montgomery County to build out their computer science departments at the high school level. And so they have this dual role of working at the undergraduate level to kind of build out a pipeline and mentor and teach as well as put in place Demand, like increase the demand for computer science teachers by building our computer science programs into Montgomery County schools. 